it's like a game. You, know, you have to kind of look at it like you're playing a football game. And sometimes there are bad calls and sometimes things happen. You just got to get up the next day and play the next game and make the next movie. Three times in our lifetimes in modern history, there's been a content gold rush. The first time is when pay cable and cable TV came in. All of a sudden you went from having four networks to having hundreds and they needed content. So they just were running around producing, getting whatever they can. Then comes home video, and now video stores have 25,000 shelf spaces. In other words, a video store can fit 25,000 titles in their shelves. They need 25,000 titles. They had zero. So when I started, there was a content gold rush like cable television, and today we have it with streaming services. Streaming services need content to fill those swim lanes. So three times this has happened. I happened to be lucky and was in the forefront of the second, which was home video. We had to make 80 movies a year for six years. Buy them, make them, co-produce them, acquire them. We don't care, don't lose money. And as a result, we had this wonderful opportunity to find directors, producers, scripts we like, and take chances. Our whole point, which is contrary to what happens today, was to push the envelope. Come up with a great concept, go wild, try something crazy, do something nuts, go, go for it. And that's what we did. I wanted to make Platoon, and Austin said, whoa, 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 you, I mean, I never question you, but we're making genre movies and horror movies and you know sexy comedies and action movies. This is about the Vietnam War. It's depressing and there's no stars in it. All those guys became stars, but they weren't stars. We had done Salvador with Oliver and I loved it and I thought the world was ready for a Vietnam movie and I really wanted to make it. And so Austin said, okay, you're head of production. You can make it if you want, but you gotta bet your job. If it fails, you're fired. What do you want to do? I was 18 months into my career with the best job imaginable and stupidly or smartly, however you want to play it, I said, okay. I think I'm the only guy in history to laugh his way, giggle his way through the first screening of Platoon when they showed it to me early one morning when they finished in Italy because I thought, oh my God, I'm not getting fired. Then a few years later, I ran into Oliver Stone in a bar one night in New York and he said, you know, kid, I always liked you. You have a takes, you have a touch of the madness. And I thought, that's a great expression, a touch of the madness. That's what all those guys had at those times. Austin had it by letting a kid like me make a decision. I had it by betting the best job in the world on it. Oliver had it by bucking every trend and making the movie. And all these guys had a touch of the madness. And I still look for that in innovation today, in technology, in filmmaking. If you can find that touch of the madness and harness it, you can do something great. Along comes Thriller. We know it's gonna be a hit. We want Thriller. How can we put Thriller, which is great, but I think 12 minutes on home video? So if we did a documentary called Making Thriller, which included Thriller, essentially we're selling Thriller. And that was the first million selling home video uh, cassette ever. Here's the vibe of Dream a Little Dream. Corey and Corey, Corey Haim and Corey Feldman, in those days were incredibly famous. It's almost hard to understand today how famous they were. It opened huge on Friday night, but it really was, I have to admit, it really was confusing at the end. And so it, it, it fell. But the song, Rock On, and the album became a smash hit. I still have the, 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 the Rock On Gold record in my office here now, and launched a Michael Damien Rock On tour for 18 months. One of the first things I ever did in my original programming days at Vestron was I made Weight Watchers home video. Like I, they were all these workout tapes at the time, and Lynn Redgrave was the spokesperson. And this was actually the, my first production, I was a, few, a few months into it, and I was nervous as can be. It was $100,000, which I thought was an incredible amount of money. And I, I couldn't sleep the night before in New York when Lynn was gonna come and shoot the whole exercise and, and, and workout video and fitness video. I'm listening to the news in New York, not asleep, and there's word on the radio that Sir Michael Redgrave, her father, a very famous actor, died. And I thought, oh my God, what a tragedy. What are we gonna do? I can't believe it. And obviously I was you know, concerned for them. She came. She showed up the next, a few hours later the next morning, not to shoot, you know, with all due respect to everyone in Weight Watchers, not to shoot uh, the sequel to The Godfather, but to shoot Weight Red Watchers home video. She came and she did an amazing performance and then flew home to England. Just because that was the level of commitment and professionalism those actors had in those days. And it was the best lesson you could ever get as a first production of how you're supposed to conduct yourself. I started thinking, okay, since we have all this latitude, you, you can't imagine the freedom I had to go make these movies. Just don't lose money. So I started calling people I wanted to make movies with. I, that's how we got to know Oliver Stone. That's how we got to know lots of people. Ken Russell, we just called great filmmakers and said, hey, wanna make a movie? We went to see a very, very, very famous writer and said, uh, listen, there's this thing called home video now and we will make any movie you wanna make for $5 million because we wanna work with you. 
And the guy looked at us, and he was British, and he said, let me get this straight. You children come to my office and offer me $5 million to make a movie about something called home video? What is this nonsense? Of course, we didn't make a movie with him. But a lot of other people said, great. It's like a game. You, know, you have to kind of look at it like you're playing a football game. And sometimes there are bad calls, and sometimes things happen. You just got to get up the next day and play the next game and make the next movie. If I look back, we made hundreds of movies at Vestron. Still, some of my best friends are from there. Still, filmmakers got their launches from there. So I don't think we can look at what didn't happen. I think we have to look at you know six years of 80 movies a year. It's great.